for the intro, Elisa. Uh, so I am Richard Bultitude and uh, yeah, I'm a part-time musician, I suppose, and, uh, and creative coder amongst other things. Um, and uh, yeah, I wanted to um, tell you all a story about um, music and weather data. Uh, so I will just share my screen. Let me know uh, when you can see my presentation. Wonderful. Yeah, so making music with weather data. Um, so yeah, uh, I suppose the way I should start this tale is by uh, explaining um, the uh, the inspiration behind coming up with uh, such an idea um, and just to clarify what the idea was or what it manifested as uh, it was a web application which you can go to now it's live called the conditional orchestra um, and it will essentially take your current weather data and turn it into music um, and uh, this was a project that took me, I guess, end to end a couple of years because I did it in my spare time. Um, but uh, it was an idea that had grown um, from um, various experiences I had uh, in a few, you know, the few years prior to that. Um, and I'm hoping some of you may even recognize this, but this is the C organ, um, which is, uh, I guess, a kind of piece of coastal architecture. Um, that is um, in Zadar in Croatia. Um, and this part of Croatia was bombed in the war um, and needed a bit of a rethink. And so um, the, the use of this public space, this obviously beautiful bit of coastline um, was assigned to an architect, um, Nikola Basic, who decided to essentially use um, the shape and the force of waves to, to generate music. So for those of you that, that aren't familiar with this, essentially as the waves lap against the shore, they force air through a series of chambers um, and they play different notes. So let's have a quick listen. Okay, so that might sound um, a little strange. It probably sounds strange anyway, because obviously playing it out of my speakers and, and into the microphone, uh, because we can't do this, um, this talk in person. But um, yeah, some people may think that it sounds like uh, some deranged uh, pan pipe players. Uh, I actually think it's quite beautiful, um, but it's a really, really interesting idea um, for me anyway, because it is converting something natural into, uh, into something uh, artistic, something subjective. Um, and so I thought it would be a good idea for us just to quickly think about what the actual data uh, inputs and outputs are. Um, so if you think about it as um, there being two inputs, which are the source for the actual notes. So the height of the tide, um, that is going to determine how many notes are playing because uh, each step uh, has, has um, uh, different, um, uh, di different um, chambers for the air to flow through and the actual direction of flow of the waves themselves. And then of course there's the, the wave pressure, which more directly equates to the volume in decibels. Um, and around this time, I started um, exploring generative music. Um, uh, and I wrote a blog series called Generative Music in Reason. Reason is a um, piece of music production software. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that at all today. And I've, I've left out of this presentation, you know, a lot of the work that I did around kind of music theory, because I um, obviously want to focus on, on the data. Um, but the reason I'm telling you about this is because um, generative music is about designing a system which which creates music rather than actually writing the score or, or, or sequencing using um, you know software or hardware. Um, and um, this kind of started to create um, a connection in my mind between what the data source could be in a generative system. Um, and, and, you know, started um, to make me think about um, how I would actually also achieve that. 
Um, I just want to quickly tell you about another project which really inspired me at the time. Um, and I'm hoping quite a few of you recognize this. So this is um, <laughs> an installation which I believe is still there at the South Bank. Um, and it's actually a hotel room you can stay in. So someone, um, uh, some genius, <laughs> decided to put a boat uh, on the uh, quite brutalist architecture of the Queen Elizabeth Hall. Um, and when this first went up, it actually had a weather station on it. So at the top in this picture, you can see uh, that it has uh, a very simple weather station, which is basically going to measure wind speed and direction. And the artist, James Bridal, uh, who's an excellent speaker, by the way, and if, um, uh, if anyone on this call has ever seen him speak, then um, yeah, I'm sure you'll have been really inspired by lots of um, his work. But um, he came up with this idea of actually setting that physical ship, which is permanently based on that structure, uh, adrift, um, setting it free, essentially, by using data. So he recorded the data uh, of the wind speed and direction, and he plotted the course of the, of the, of the virtual idea of this boat uh, over the course of a year, and actually made its way all the way to, um, to Northern Australia, uh, to the Northern coast of Australia. But I just love this idea that something, um, something permanent and physical had been, had been set free. And I love the idea of just using two simple inputs to produce this, this, this piece of work. Uh, and so I thought, okay, why don't I come up with, um, why don't I create a simple proof of concept um, that is gonna do something similar, but with different outcomes. So wind speed um, be mapped to volume uh, and wind bearing um, mapped to pitch. And I came up with this idea of the, uh, uh, what I called at the time, the musical weather vane. So I just picked three places in the world, Montevideo, Tokyo and Cape Town. Um, I got live weather data um, from Dark Sky Service, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, and I essentially just mapped the speed and the bearing um, to three different notes, one for each place. So it produced, as you can hopefully hear, some quite strange and slightly spooky music. Um, and the reason being is because the, um, yeah, that I haven't mapped it to a particular musical tuning system. So it's just taking those values and applying them and therefore it's, um, yeah, generating music, which is, I suppose, unconventional. Um, so just briefly about the actual weather data. Um, so I used Dark Skies, I've just mentioned. Um, at the time, they were an independent company. As a side note, they have actually been bought by Apple. Um, so <laughs> at some point in 2021, um, my application or anything that anyone uses um, uh, is going to have to change because they are likely to, I guess, monetize it or, or make some changes to the API. But it's a super useful service. It gives you um, weather forecasts, but it gives you current weather data uh, too. Uh, and just a quick sample here of the JSON that you actually get back for those that are interested in data formats. Um, and pretty much everything you get back is either a number or a string. Um, so there's a little bit of work to do, depending on what you're doing and processing that data. So I had essentially a proof of concept, which I was really pleased with, as simple as it was, but obviously it wasn't going to do anything um, that anyone particularly enjoyed. Um, you know, it was completely static. Um, and there was no call to action. So it was time for me to actually do some design. And that's when I came up with the idea of the conditional orchestra. So yeah, the, the, the first call to action I, I decided to implement was play my weather. So one simple ask for uh, anyone visiting this website, uh, play my weather. So um, that's going to obviously retrieve your current location um, and generate the music from that. So uh, just to elaborate a little bit further, it's going to need to ask for permission, um, like any web application that wants to do something with your personal data. Uh, and once you've allowed it, um, it's going to essentially give you some lat long data. So uh, I've just done this diagram to um, explain as simply as possible uh, precisely what happens. So the app asks for that data from your browser, uh, provided you accept it, then you get the, um, the application gets the latitude and longitude data in response. And then it's gonna do two things with that. It's going to send that to the Google Maps API, 
because I need to do um, a reverse geolocation lookup, which means that I want from that lat long data a human readable place name. Um, and I'm also going to request my weather data from Dark Sky. Um, so I can output the, the place name um, and also actually quite a pretty looking map um, in, the, in the user interface. Um, and obviously I can generate the music from the weather data. Um, but I decided to also add a second option. Um, and this was so that I could allow people to essentially explore the whole world. So you can add your own custom location. You'll notice that I steer people towards Siberia <laughs> because it actually produces some of the most interesting music, in my opinion. Um, and I actually use a different tuning system for places that are bitterly cold um, so as to kind of evoke the um, yeah, evoke, evoke, evoke the weather and the experience of being there. How that works is slightly different. Um, so in this case, the user obviously has just entered some data, which is a text string. Um, and then I use the Google Places API to actually get the lat long coordinates um, from that place name. Uh, and it does a very, very good job of that. If you type in um, you know, some pretty poorly spelled place names uh, or even things that don't exist, it'll always come back, nearly always come back with something useful, uh, which is great. Um, and then I can pass that latitude and longitude data to Dark Sky and then generate the music as described before. Um, and so this is the kind of um, weather data that um, I was concerned with. Um, this isn't a comprehensive list, but these are some of the most useful um, you know, weather facets. Um, so as you can imagine, um, one of the challenges was um, you know, which ones, from a creative point of view, which ones to assign to which aspects of the music. Um, you know, so if the cloud cover is, is high and the temperature is low, uh, maybe it's raining, um, you know, I want to evoke a particular uh, ex experience. Um, uh, and so that essentially led me to creating conditions. So I actually had to, uh, here's a sample of some of my code, some of the more simple code in the application I might add. Um, but, you know, I had to create these, these arbitrary conditions for myself and, and sort of concoct them from that weather data, you know. So some are quite straightforward, if, you know, is it muggy? Is it smoggy? Uh, and then some are, I kind of had to make up in order to give myself more options. Um, so it's Sirocco is uh, essentially a very specific wind that blows, um, I think, in Saudi Arabia. But I took that, that name and I, you know, I created a condition, essentially, so that I could apply it to the music. And I needed quite a lot of these different conditions in order to generate um, music that was varied and different enough for each user experience. Um, but here's a, an interesting juncture in my, in my journey, and that is, asking myself the question what is actually missing now so I'd you know I'd created an experience I was really happy with um but yeah what was it that was actually missing from this and I suppose my question um is actually about the experience itself and not about the technology um and I'm hoping some of you are thinking the same thing I was which is user feedback so this is where I actually needed um, qualitative data. This is where I actually needed to know what people thought of the application itself. And one of the things that was pointed out um, really early on in this um, was, you know, I have no idea what it's doing. Um, and I, it just hadn't crossed my mind at all. I thought, you know, I, you can press, press a button and, you know, it, it's going to it's going to play you music from anywhere in the world, depending on what the weather conditions are. Isn't that fantastic? Well, people wanted to know what it was actually doing underneath. And this is a really unusual request in a way for a web developer or a, a software developer. I mean, normally, you know, when you use Microsoft Word, um, you don't care what it's doing underneath, right? You just care about the uh, about what it's helping you achieve. But in this particular case, what I was making was something um, creative as you know, as an experience and people wanted to understand that experience. So I suppose the point I'm trying to make here is, is that I had to figure out a way of mapping what was actually happening underneath um, 
to, to the user interface, which wasn't as trivial as you might think. You might think that I'd just be e easily able to grab, um, you know, the, the storm bearing, for example, and show what that's, um, what that's doing, what that's applying to. But remember that lots of the mappings that were happening underneath were, um, they're not described in any way, they're just code. So it was, there was a big process of making that data human readable so that people could understand what was happening. Uh, and actually that took me about six months. I'm not saying it was six months, you know, daily, um, daily coding, but, you know, doing this project in my spare time um, and trying to problem solve um, meant that it was, you know, quite a commitment to get it to the next stage. And also I decided to add some features of my own. Um, so, you know, I wanted to respond to the time of day. So you get a light theme if it's daytime and you get a dark theme if it's night. And um, if it's hot or if it's over a certain temperature, then it, you know, it, the colors turn warmer. If it's raining, you get a kind of um, pattern in the background and so on. So, you know, just something to bring the UI to life a bit more. Uh, and here's probably the most, possibly the most interesting um, part of the story um, for those interested in, in you know, in, in understanding how I use data to to actually get the final result, because yeah, the the the, the number of combinations that are possible uh, is actually very very high. So from a musical perspective, I had to build in some redundancy for that and make sure that when melodies are playing um, and different instruments are playing, that they're not fighting with each other and it doesn't sound, you know, um, unharmonious. Um, but also, obviously, what's happening is, you know, there are lots of different ways that the weather can combine. Um, and so I had to rely on some kind of service to give me realistic test data. So I use windy.com, which is a really amazing um, real-time weather application um, that actually shows you where the wind, rain, snow, whatever it is, uh, you know, physically is and which direction it's going in. Um, and so I relied on this really heavily in order to test my test my edge cases. So I would find somewhere in the world where, you know, the weather was really cold, bitter, windy, for example, or really hot and dry. Um, and it was incredibly useful for that. Um, yeah, just another side note, actually, and something that I learned the hard way is that um, despite having done geography A-level at school, um, I didn't actually realize quite how much um, extreme weather takes place only at sea, because of course, as soon as it hits the land, it breaks up, um, and, and it, you know, and it changes and it's slowed down essentially, especially by big mountain ranges, for example. Um, and there are no places in the sea, so I can't use Google Maps to to look up a place in the sea because you know, unless it's an island. Um, you know, there's nothing there that you can actually search for. Um, yes, I could search for lat long coordinates. Um, and yes, if you were at sea, um, it would look up that location. But generally speaking, most people are on land and, um, you know, this was just a quirk of the testing experience. Um, so there, were quite, there was quite a lot of work making sure I had realistic test data that I could pump in. Um, so yeah, it's probably time we listen to it. Um, hopefully you will be able to if I exit this, oops. Bear with me one second. Okay, let me know if you can see my web browser. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Uh, yeah. So this is the uh, this is the app. Um, if I play, you should hear some music. Okay, that was um, your brief sample of uh, the conditional orchestra. 
which um yeah i hope you um check out and enjoy after this talk um yeah a couple of side notes um i nominated um it for a couple of awards and too badly for a, for a solo designer and developer um getting a w3 award silver was 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 really great and allowed me to you know to promote it to a wider audience um because i didn't really obviously have a marketing budget um i added a few extra features to the app that would allow me to, to share it on social media so i could actually talk about uh what was happening so you can share a, a given location with someone else of course that location is only going to have that weather for a certain amount of time so um something to bear in mind um but yeah i suppose some in summary you know what i learned was well number one um when you're doing a personal project like this that perseverance is everything there were so many roadblocks in this and so many detours i had to make uh, that I haven't mentioned in the talk, um, especially with regards to kind of musical tuning systems and and the lack of the software out there that I needed. So I ended up writing a lot more than I expected to. Uh, and perseverance was essential to essentially get to a point where I could test it with real people. Um, and I learned a lot about weather data, way more than I thought I needed to, um, uh, having been interested in, in weather, you know, since I was a child. Um, and I learned a lot about music theory, which again, you know, as a musician, I thought I understood, but actually didn't. So um, yeah, it was an amazing journey. And um, I hope that everyone listening has learned something too. Thank you, Richard. It was really interesting. I think we have a few questions uh, in the chat, uh, just to get us started. Um, if you want to unmute, um, so James, um, James Lemon, if you want to unmute and ask your question, or I can read it for you. I can read it for you, James. Uh, so the question is, did you think about uh, what was the music like on day X location? Yeah, so I've been asked that a few times and yeah, um, actually storing um, previous conditions um, and, you know, configurations or, you know, the state of the, of the app um, in a database and being able to refer to it is, is definitely a really great idea for a feature. Um, have I had the time to develop that feature? No, um, but yeah, I, I did think about it um, and I'd love to do it. There are other projects that I've been working on since in my spare time. Um, but yeah, it would be a nice one to come back to. I mean, it's all open source. Everything I, 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 um, I have um, uh, is available on, on my GitHub, uh, which the links which I can share afterwards. Um, so, you know, if, if you or anyone else is interested in actually collaborating, that would be fantastic. The next question is from uh, Angus, if Angus wants to um, read the question. Or can read it again. Um, the question is, um, so does Rhythm provide tuning systems or instruments or is it something you had to figure out yourself? Um, so uh, Reason doesn't provide um, alternative tuning systems. I've seen people asking uh, on their, um, uh, you know, on their blog, on their on their um, forum, sorry, um, for that feature. And I don't think they're particularly interested in, in doing it. I'm actually writing an article, um, drafting an article right now, which is about exactly this, about the lack of support for different tuning systems in, in music software. Um, yes, I had to figure it out for myself. So I didn't use Reason for anything um, to do with this app. It's all written in JavaScript, it's all, it's all web technologies. Uh, and yes, um, I, I had to go on a, like a six month detour to, to, to write the music engine for this, which is called Freaky. Um, I, again, I can share the link afterwards. Um, and um, yeah, that, that allows you to um, just define a set of intervals that you want. So there could be any, any number in, in, um, in a musical scale. Um, and it, what it will give you back is the actual frequencies um that you want in, a, in any tuning system well in a set of tuning systems that i've catered for uh so yes that was um quite uh yeah quite a major undertaking that i didn't expect to have to do 
And uh, then we have an interesting question from, from Sharon, um, who is asking if it would be interesting to interview blind people and ask them how they hear the weather outlook, if it's something that you thought about. That is a really great idea and a really great question. Uh, I mean, I'm really, really passionate about building digital products that are accessible to everyone. Um, and I think there's always a lot to be learned from um, different users experiences and I've worked with um, various um, blind people before um, from the INIB and, and through other organizations to test how they might build um, and understanding their experience is really really important to making a better application and a better piece of software and in this particular case yeah that's it's such a um, it's an yeah it's a really inspiring question I, I would love to um, I would love to understand what yeah how, how other people interpret the weather um, uh, and, and, and for as many of those people um, of different you know abilities or backgrounds to to, to share their experience so um, yes um, because this is a personal project um, I haven't got any budget to to hire testers but you know yeah if you have any ideas or want to get in touch to discuss that I, I would love to continue the conversation I don't know if Cheryl wants to follow up on this. I, I, I read the question, but I don't know, maybe Cheryl wants to add something to this. Or... Can you hear me? Yeah, very well. Ah, excellent. Um, yeah, to me, it'd be fascinating if um, blind people had some feeling of how snow sounds to them or rain sounds to them musically, because they're going to, I think, be more tuned to it potentially. Um, but yeah, I'll, uh, I'll perhaps connect with you on Twitter so we can swap. Um, so as I actually work for uh, currently at the Centre for Advanced Spatial Analysis and we do a lot of um, visualisation. So we did a lot of work with, um, for example, the project that helped um, blind people hear environments in order to navigate around them too. So um, but I'll, uh, I'll follow you on Twitter and, uh, and perhaps we can do some conversation. Yeah, that sounds fascinating. Yeah, I mean, I would love to work in that field, actually. So, uh, yes, look forward to continuing that. Thanks. And then we have another question from Luke. If Luke wants to unmute and ask a question. So I can read it. Um, so Luke is asking, does he make one request to the weather data source and then sees a piece of music from those initial conditions? Or if you keep a piece of playing, uh, if you keep a piece playing, does he make numerous requests to modify the piece as it plays? Yeah, good question, um, because I probably didn't quite explain that very clearly, but um, yeah, it makes one request and so it will continue to play the music at that given time for as long as you have um, that playing. If you stop and then play again, it will make a new request. So it's one request per um, entry of the, you know, submission of the form, if that makes sense. Um, it doesn't poll. Um, which is um, obviously asking over and over again and it doesn't stream um, that would be a really lovely feature it, a few people have asked me that before you know wouldn't it be cool if it took uh, a stream of data and continuously evolved as it played and I, I absolutely agree uh, it would I probably yeah I would probably consider doing it in a, a in a different way I would probably consider making some kind of native app or um, yeah something that used slightly lower level code um to do that because that's you know that's, that's that's a bit more hardcore um this was designed to be you know very sort of open you know shareable easy to use on the web but um but yeah it, it um it's slightly more static in that sense Then we have another question from um, Jeff, who is asking, have you thought about using financial or any other data? I would like to put something like this on my website. Wow, yeah, I, I hadn't thought about using financial data. Um, had thought about using other data sources. Um, so, you know, there could be, rather than a conditional orchestra, there could be, a, um, you know, a nautical orchestra or something, you know. Um, so, yeah, I thought about using other um, inputs from the natural world. Hadn't thought about using anything from uh, from the human world, from the business world. Um, yeah, would love to discuss that with you further. Um, I think that could be really, really interesting. Um, it wouldn't be that difficult to switch the data source. Um, uh, I suppose the, the question is, is just from a creative perspective, um, you know, what 
what experiences are we trying to convey based on the financial data? You know, is, are we, if there's a crash, <laughs> you know, is the music um, particularly, uh, uh, you know, unnerving or, uh, you know, are we celebrating a great day in the markets? Um, yeah, I'd be, I'd, I'd love to um, know more about what you're thinking there. Um, Jeff, do you want to follow up maybe? Or I saw you uh, left your email address in the chat. Yeah, I'll um I'll I'll drop you a line, Jeff. So thanks for sharing your email. Perfect. Then we have another question from we have a question from uh, Natasha who is asking uh, when you started out, how much of a plan per se did you have about the project trajectory and what was your motivation? Yeah, how much of a plan? Um so I didn't have I didn't have a huge plan to begin with. I'd say the first six months were me just exploring, um, yeah, um, kind of what happens when you plug these two different things together. Um, but once I I think once I'd thought about the the, the kind of key proposition, you know, the, the play my weather, um, everything went very quickly from there. It became a lot clearer what I needed to do, and I did have a, a rough project plan. Uh, as I say, I mean, that project plan, like any project plan, um, uh, had all kinds of setbacks and detours which weren't anticipated. Um, I suppose it's like getting some building work done on your house. Um, <laughs> there's always something that you uncover that you didn't expect that that um, takes you longer or costs more money. But um, yeah, I suppose, as I say, once I had the key idea, um, the, the, the vision at least, and, and therefore some of the plan um, became clearer. Um, my motivation was, um, I suppose, um, as a uh, as a musician um, to um, play a different instrument, you know, so use data as a different instrument. You know, I love playing my piano and the guitar and, and I do a lot of programming music on a computer. But yeah, what, what if I actually let the music create itself um, was a question I wanted to. It was an inquiry. Um, so that was my main motivation. Then we have a couple of uh, new questions. So Angus is asking, have you talked about, have you talked to any producers, musicians or musicians about turning turning this into a BSP or tool for making music? No, I haven't. And that is something I would love to do. Yeah, I would love to take um, what I can of it and, and convert it into, um, yeah, a virtual studio instrument. Um, that would be, that would be awesome. I, I, I'm not sure how much of the actual code I could salvage, so I think it would be a bit of a rewrite. Um, but yeah, I could certainly take a lot of the logic and the way the data flows through the application um, and reapply that. Um, yeah, that would be something I would probably want to do uh, as a commission or something because, you know, yeah, um, or, or as a partnership. But yeah, I'd love to work with someone on that. Um, really, yeah, really good question um would need help or would need money <laughs> to be totally frank <laughs> perfect and then we have um one more from luke who is asking um to follow on from uh his previous question um does he use any stochastic or, or ran randomness or will the process create identical pieces of music from the same initial uh, conditions. If it's the same, they would be really interesting with regards to sharing an audio snapshot uh, of a place and time. Yeah, um, I'm really glad you asked that because um, whether to put randomness in the application and, and in, in, in this piece of work or not was a big question of me. And I have to say, I actually did, I did weave in some randomness because I wanted each listen to be even just slightly different. Um, the differences might be subtle. They might even be barely noticeable. Um, maybe it loops for, you know, one beat less a bar or something. Um, but I wanted that to be, I wanted some randomness to be in there because, you know, the nature is, um, um, I guess a system that has so many variables that it feels like it's random. Of course, you know, you could argue that, you know, of course, that there is cause and effect and um, and, it, and everything in nature can be described by maths, right? But um, 
as we experience the weather, it's never the same twice, is it? So, so I did put some randomness in there. So it doesn't, um, as you say, actually capture that snapshot of a place and time necessarily. I have made some recordings of some of the weather conditions and places that I thought were really great. Uh, and I've put a few of them on my um, frond, which is a, one of my um, music projects. I've put that on my SoundCloud again, um, if, 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 um, if it's possible for me to share all these links with you all afterwards, I will do. Um, so I have got some snapshots and, you know, feel free if you use it to, you know, to, to take your own recordings of it. And um, yeah, I think that is a, um, a, a, an interesting point, though, um, in that the randomness in there does change that um, relationship between the experience you had and, uh, and um, it being um, historical uh, documentation. So yeah, so it doesn't work like that. So Luc is saying, great answer. If you're dealing with weather, it is fitting that a bit of ransomness feeds in. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm glad you like the answer. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I, the, um, I see that the the also the one before considering yeah. using um, Max Eight um, is it. I guess you're asking about Max MSP, uh, and if you are, then um, I haven't considered using it for this, but I do love that kind of software. Um, you know, I love playing with um, software that allows you to create systems and kind of generate music art output of some kind, um, uh, you know, without, without you being the sole controller. Let's change its name, right, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I would love to. Yeah, it's a good idea. Yeah, I, it'd be interesting to um, to to cook something up um, with that involved. Perfect. I don't know if you're if any of the participants have any other any other question. Any last minute? Com there are so many positive comments. It was a it was a really interesting and really fascinating conversation. Um, yeah, again, lots of really interest, really um, positive comments. Um, yeah, I, I actually had a question uh, from my side. I was just wondering if you could tell us a bit more about, about your audience, uh, if there is a way for you to know um, kind of the demographics and who is actually really interested in, 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 in this kind of uh, music. Yeah, um, I can't answer that question particularly easily. I mean, well, I mean I've, I've got some basic tracking on the, on the site. Um, which tells me, you know, really um, very little. You know, it's just a, a typical Google Analytics, um, um, and it's going to tell me location and, and, and number of visits and so on. I suppose I can um, I can infer a bit more uh, from similar talks that I've given and people that have approached me or DM'd me about it, and I get the feeling that it's it's really appreciated, mainly by uh, people interested in very similar things. You know, it's it. In a way, I'm sort of playing to my peers, perhaps with this kind of um, this kind of thing. Um, you know, people that are interested in um, in music, generative music. Um, uh, you know, sort of um, I guess creative coding, uh, those kind of things. But I have had people message me who are just um, you know just um, I suppose enjoy. Um, you know, art in all of its forms and, and, and see this as an art project, which I think is really nice. And um, yeah, and that that's kind of what I want. I would love it to appeal to to, uh, to a wider audience. And someone mentioned to me once that um, this is exactly the kind of thing that lots of kids would really enjoy. And, and they and this person played it to, or gave, you know, their, their kids the opportunity to play with it and they absolutely loved it. So I'd love to see, you know, an open-minded geography teacher or art teacher or someone um, use it in class. Um, and, you know, from an education perspective, I'm, I'm really, really interested in developing software um, that is educational and, uh, and, and is for play. You know, I think play is a great way of learning, whether you're a child or an adult. Um, so, yeah, if anyone on the call wants to discuss that, I, I would, I, I, you know, I'm super passionate about that. And I, that's actually an area I'd love to work in rather than just doing it in my spare time. Perfect. I was just given a couple of minutes to see if anyone else had any other questions, but uh, I think we don't have um, any other questions from the participants now. Uh, but anyway, I think everyone should have access to your, your details and should be able to uh, reach out to you um, individually. 
Uh, I really want to thank you, uh, Richard, for this very fascinating conversation. And also wanted to thank all the participants for the really good questions. Uh, and uh, we, we hope to see you again very soon at uh, the next lunchtime lecture of UDI. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day.